morning in sunny Florida, so we won't hold that against him. But a couple announcements. One is, as you can see, we have props for Dinner Theater going up right now. And we just want to remind everybody that Dinner Theater will be coming up in the next Sunday. We are going to have Sign Up Sunday where we can all participate and be a part of this and find ways in which we can help Dinner Theater. So next Sunday, uh, please come prepared to uh, decide and help sign up for that. Um, also, if you noticed, there are banners along in the narthex of Dartball, and this is the, is, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the 50th anniversary, or did you have something to say? Okay, then you guys come up and share that. All three of you are? Yep. All right, I'm sitting down. play dartball we're not real sharp um, <laughs> just wanted to pass like uh, John was saying the resemblance of 50 years worth of dartball here in Oakland or the banners that are out there for display just wanted to kind of share those with you uh, tomorrow night starts a tournament for dartball 2018-19 and it'll be held at uh, 204 West 4th First United Methodist Church uh, we play uh, at 7 o'clock tomorrow night and then goes through Monday night, Tuesday night, and then on Thursday nights the finals. But here's a representation from Dartball Team 1 and Dartball Team 2, and I'll let them give their little uh, speech. I don't have a speech. You're just going down. <laughs> You're going down, Bob. <laughs> you know, I still... <laughs> I'm mad about you beating us two out of three games. We haven't forgotten that. I haven't either. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we want to meet you in the finals. But you're going to take the roosters back up to get back to the finals. We'll know more tomorrow night, won't we? Uh, right. <laughs> Good luck, Bob. <laughs> and luck to you. I guess we're going to talk about peace this morning. <laughs> um, a couple other announcements. One uh, is that uh, I just want to invite you. We have been having a Bible study on Monday mornings at 10 a.m. where we have been going through the Gospels. And as a group, some of us decided that that's a good time to meet. So we're going to continue to go. We're going to call it Journey Through the Bible. So if any of you are willing to come or want to come, that is open to anybody. And we will start again at 10 a.m. on Monday. This week we will be talking about the Gospel of John and then we're just going to keep going through the books of the New Testament. So again, that's at 10 a.m. on Monday mornings. And Tony has... <clears throat> What you, what you have done really does matter. Uh, there we go. So, yeah, there we go. What you have done really does matter. Um, right now, we have 186 children wow. that are going to get the nutrients that they need for a whole year because of what you have done. So when John says what you do matters, I think if you lived in Nigeria, this little church, what they have done has mattered so much to so many people. We've gathered $1,115 as of right now, which is exciting. And like I said, I know there's one suitcase on its way to Nigeria that we are paying for right now. So what you have done matters in so many ways. And thank you so them. much. They already sent them. Thanks. Your wife, won't you? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, this is your friendly reminder that we have a couple youth trips coming up. Um, the deadline is approaching for Superstart. Um, if you are interested, if you have anyone who is fourth through sixth grade, this is the event for them. We go one overnight down to the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky area, 
and um, worship for two days. It's high energy. It's a lot of fun. The preteens really love it. I have information down in the east wing on the information wall, so you will see all of the, the details on this paper, or come talk to me if you're interested. And then um, another reminder about National Junior High Youth Conference. It's this summer, June 14th through 16th at Elizabethtown College in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. And this is another great opportunity for those in sixth through eighth grade to get connected, to learn more about the Church of the Brethren, um, and have fun and fellowship on this trip. So if you have any questions, please get a hold of me. Um, and again, there's information down at the East Wing about these trips. Thank you. Good morning. Typically in our worships, we end with a benediction that is a blessing. But today I would like to start our worship with a blessing. May the blessing of God fall on our community. May it be a safe place, full of understanding and acceptance, where you can be as you are without the need of any mask or pretense or image. May this place be one of discovery, discovery of the love of God, 
the peace of Jesus and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, where from the clay all can emerge to deepen and refine their knowledge in God's kingdom. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit and join in singing, Here I Am to Worship. Please be seated. With our offerings, we pray for people who are overlooked, unnoticed, hidden away by policy, in the corners of our minds, of our society, of our world. We give thanks for the people who look us in the eye, who do not flinch our, at our humanity, who do not turn away from our vulnerability, who see us with the eyes of love, who see us as God sees us with clarity and grace. As the ushers wait upon us, please sign and pass the friendship pads in your pews.
Thank you, Chris. Let's sing the kids down. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. How is everyone today? Good. Good? Brian gave me the backpack. Is he here? He's not here today? Who gave? No? Oh, Colin Harper. You, I thought you were giving this to me for Brian. So, hey, I question. Did anybody build any snow forts? You did? You tried to build a snowman? How many people tried to build a snowman? You did? Yeah. You want to know what happened one year? My brother and I, we built this awesome snow fort, right? And we built tunnels in the backyard, and we built this one little secret place that when we went in there, we had this little room where my brother and I crawled down in there, and you know what my dad did? He put on a mask and was waiting for me in that bottom room. <laughs> I thought we weren't going to make it out of the snow fort alive. But that's my family, not yours. We're going to talk about that today. So let's see what's in the backpack. Okay, we have a remote control. A TV. a TV. Okay, it's a television remote control, right? Don't use it? Why not? Oh, don't lose it, right? <laughs> He's been in trouble before. You want to know what I do so I don't lose the remote? Look, you put it upside down right on your shoulder, and it just sits there. This is like first world problems, people. All right, so what does a remote control do, though? It turns on the TV. Right. It turns on the television. It changes the volume. It helps so we don't have to get up and do it, right? When I was your age, you couldn't believe it. If I wanted to change the channel, I had to get off the couch and go turn a knob. You would and then I'd sit back down and then my dad would say, go turn the channel again. It was, it was a tough life. But so this gives us some power, right? It gives us some power so that we can just sit home and enjoy some things. So now I got to equate, equate a remote control to God, right? Right. Even though we are not puppets and I don't, you know, nobody makes us do what we want, God kind of stands in the back and helps us out, right? So when we need a little bit of help or something, God can say, okay, John, here's some, here's some help, here's some power, and we pray and we ask God to help control us a little bit, right? Yeah. I know you guys don't understand that yet, but one day you will, okay? But God is in control and helps us out. So I'm going to give this back to you, and that's going to go back to Miss Heather, so why don't, we, why don't we have a short prayer and then you can go back, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you that you help us. We thank you that you are there guiding us and helping us be the, the girls and boys you are calling us to be. So as we continue our journeys, we thank you. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you.
Thank you. As we come to the altar with some prayer requests, one, two things I would like to remind you of. One is a um, reminder in case you didn't hear during the announcements, but uh, team number one and team number two will be playing against each other in the first game of the tournament tomorrow at 7 p.m. at the First United Methodist Church if you are wanting to go and cheer them on. And then also, just to note that Jenna and Clayton Briggs welcomed their daughter Townsley Grace Briggs to this world on the 30th of um, January, so we just want to congratulate them on the new addition. Um, and with that said, I will ask that you can bow your heads and we'll have a moment of silence and then I would like to read to you the Lord's Prayer, well, from the New England, the New Zealand's version of the Lord's Prayer. So if we can bow our heads and have a moment of silence and then we can pray. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God who is in heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the people of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come to earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. And from the grip that all is evil, free us. For your reign is the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Going and singing Healer of Our Every Ill. Healer of our every ill, light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our song. Spirit of all comfort, fill our hearts. Healer of our every ill, light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. i 
If you can put up the scripture verse, please. We're going to read out of Exodus 20, uh, and there's a couple other verses, but listen to these words of God. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or the, on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, how many people, if you can put up the first slide first, how many people woke up this morning and said, man, I really hope I go to church today and John talks about how God hates my parents? Or how God hates all these generations, you know, and, and how sinful we are. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those verses in the Bible where you're like, man, God's tough sometimes, right? And I don't really want to preach on it, but, but I'm going to. Because part of what we're talking about in our spirituality and, and getting to know ourselves and understanding the emotions that come with it, one of the things we have to do is go backwards to go forward, to look back, to understand where we are coming from, what we are a part of, so that we know where we can go and what God God wants for us. It's one of the foundational issues in getting to know ourselves. I mean, if you think about it, in the last four or five years, maybe, I'm not sure when it started, but you've seen like Ancestry.com or what is it, the 23andMe, where you can take a DNA swab and you can find out all about your history, where you're from. I think one of those things, you could even find some health screenings. Uh, you know, we, we talk about family trees, we talk about genograms, which we'll talk about. All of these things in an in an attempt to say, who am I? Why do I do the things that I do? Just understanding where somebody comes from is a big deal sometimes to understand how they communicate. So my entire life, one of the, and excuse me, <coughs> I don't know why my voice is losing today, but one of my biggest things I've always had to deal with in my life is that I am a loud, animated person, right? So I don't, and, and, and Eden found a sign at one of the restaurants when we went home to New York last time, and she started laughing because she said, Dad, look at the sign, and on the wall it says, I'm not yelling, I'm Italian, right? <laughs> but, but knowing that, Knowing that helps people know me, right? So they can say, well, John's getting loud and animated, but he's not mad, right? You know, John's hands are flying, but he's not upset, right? You know, it's just the way we talk. And then you go home to wherever these people are from, and you notice, wow, everybody's mad at each other. Everybody's yelling, but everybody's smiling. Everybody's having a good time. But it helps just to know where you are from. Or I remember, you know, when she was little too, she's like, dad, everyone's loud and everybody has gold chains on, right? You know, so even something as simple as that. You know, I, I was born with hair on my chest in a gold chain because I was Italian, right? That's where I'm from. All you people here love sauerkraut because you're from Germany, right? And, and, and you go to New York and you're like, I can't pronounce any of these names. And then we come here and we're like, we can't pronounce any of these names because they're different. But we know where we come from. It helps us. And what I'm trying to say is that we got to start at the beginning to figure out where we are going, right? And there's two biblical truths to what I'm trying to say this morning. And one is this, is that the blessings and sins of our families going back three to four generations profoundly impact who we are today. Now, there's two things to this. One, this is very true, and this is some hard truths that sometimes we have to acknowledge. This is also a nice Americanized idea, because now I can say, see, it's not my fault. It was my parents' fault. I had nothing to do with this, right? But again, three to four generations, and in the Bible, when it talks about family, it talks about your extended family, your immediate family, but it talks about basically it means three to four generations. So when the Bible talks about that the families that have profoundly impacted me goes all the way back to the mid-1800s, that's a lot of messed up people 
right? That's a lot of broken. It's not just in my family, but in all of our family. So that's what it's talking about in the Bible. It goes back to three to four generations of grandparents and all of this that affect us today. And, and we are affected by a lot of those things. We are also affected by a lot of things in our world. You know, you get the idea of nature versus nurture idea and arguments sometimes. But again, the most powerful group we will ever belong to, whether it is good or bad, is our family. That is the most powerful group. That is the group that has the most influence on us. When we are little, that we, we gravitate towards, that we imitate all of these things, good or bad, we carry with us. And what happens in one generation, as we know, often repeats itself in the next generation. The consequences and actions of those decisions in one generation has ripples throughout. Okay, and, and I've talked about how messed up my family is sometimes, but we're still dealing with things that my grandfather had to deal with, or, or all of this. They have ripples and consequences that we have to live with. It's not, you know, I don't just say what you do matters because I think it sounds good. I say what you do matters because it really does, and it just doesn't affect me. This, the choices I make today, according to the Bible, according to the world, will affect my great-grandchildren will have repercussions for that. Family systems, addictions, all of these things, whatever we carry around, they go. So we are called to try to do that. Again, not, very, not a very uplifting verse. Well, God's going to punish and God hates and all of these things. It's not a very uplifting verse. And, and I know what my family has done, but again, maybe that is why God calls us to be better, to say, look, you can be something bigger and better and change this world. A couple notes here real quick before we go on to the second one. I, I thought this was interesting because you, you read the Bible and it talks about God hates, God punishes. And there's a couple things I want to highlight. One, when the Bible uses the word hate, especially in the Old Testament, it's not talking about the hate that we really feel like hatred and, and animosity. It just means that you love something less. So God's saying, I hate this, I hate that, I love that less. Whether that makes that a better word or not, I just thought it was an interesting idea. And then the other thing it talks about is that when God uses the word punish in the Old Testament, it can be translated translated as consequences, okay? Now that makes a difference too. So God's not necessarily punishing and saying, John, I'm going to put my heel on you and punish you. God's just saying, you know what, John, you made some bad choices and now you're going to have to live with the consequences. And not only are you going to have to live with the consequences, but your family's going to have to live with the consequences. That's why I talk about sin being so powerful that it's not about those little things, it's about those things that break relationships and harm people. That is what God is saying are the consequences when we harm relationships. And again, certain patterns repeat themselves from generation to generation. Everybody in here can think of your families and think about the brokenness, the affairs, the divorce, the babies out of wedlock, the alcoholism, the sexual abuse, poor marriages, children running away, whatever it may be, you can say, yes, that has happened and it has repeated itself. Look at the stories in the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, if you read Genesis, especially throughout chapter 50, when you get to the story of Joseph, here you have God giving a tremendous blessing to God's people, but yet they also have to deal with the brokenness of their life. They have to deal with the murders and the lying and the nepotism and all of these issues that God is trying to tell them to be bigger of, they're still dealing with. So they are going to bless the nations, but they're always messing things up as well. So again, we just have to realize that's where we're starting. Biblical truth number two. Discipleship requires putting off the sinful patterns of our family of origin and relearning how to do life God's way. Now again, this is tough. And it's hard sometimes because we don't want to do the hard work. And the great news is, shall we accept it? You know, shall we say, yes, I want to do this? The great news is, is that now our earthly family of origins don't really matter anymore. So God says, okay, John, you came from this situation. You came from this brokenness. You did this. You did that. What are you going to do right now? Because now that you became a Christian, you are a new person. You now have a new identity. You are not known about your past. Yes, that affects you, and that is who you are, but you rise above it, and you become better. 
Now I am with your future. The most significant language in the New Testament where God talks about um, becoming a Christian. Every time Jesus talks about us changing into being a Christian or, or that life of faith, he always uses the word adoption, right? We are adopted into the family of God. We are adopted into this life of Christ. And we have this radical new beginning. It brings hope. I am no longer my past. I am now my future with God. I am reborn into God's family. God becomes the head and everything else is forgiven. And Jesus calls us to understand that we are not bound by those families, that we can be better. So discipleship then, and I think I've said this a couple times, but again, discipleship then is putting off the sinful patterns. And when I say sinful patterns, again, I want you to hear things that hurt relationships and habits of our biological families and then we are transformed into the members of Christ and we know that. You know, I heard a statement once when I was reading this week and it said in, in the book I was reading, it says that Jesus may be in your heart but grandpa is in your bones. Has anybody ever heard that before or a variation of that? I think there's another, another statement, I can't remember who says it, that says, wherever you go, there you are, right? So we can't escape. We try to, try to run from ourselves. We try to run from our past, but we can't. And sometimes things come out of us. You know, I don't know how many times, I'm sure you can say it, I don't know how many times I say something and go, man, I just sounded like my dad, or I just sounded like my mom, or whatever it was. It comes out. We act. We do that. But again, even though that statement helps me to look and understand that sometimes it's the family I hear instead of God, it helps me to do the hard work of discerning that. And, and here's the other thing I want you to know, and, and what I think God wants us to know in this passage, I don't care who you are out here, I don't care how well you hide it, all of us are broken and all of our families have issues. I don't care who you are. I, you, you can sit here and we can say, you are the perfect family. You're not. We all have to deal with this. This is a human condition. Now, we can rise above it. We can work at it. We can, we can overcome it. But we are all broken. And, you know, and I joke with Eden all the time. I tell her, you know what? I just hope, you know, I'm just giving you things to talk about in therapy one day, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, or when, when, when I go to therapy or whatever, I can tell the therapist, you're like, well, my dad or my mom did this, you know, it just, we, but what we do, what I have to realize is that we do the best that we can with what we have, right? So 99% of us will do the best we can, even if we mess things up, because it is with the tools that I am given. So now that I become a child of God, God says, John, here are some more tools for your toolbox. Here are some other ways to interact with people. Here are some ways to love and have compassion. Here are some ways to say, yes, I came from this area, but now I can do it differently here. Or how we can honor our past and all of that, but yet obey God. It's all choices that we can make and it starts with us making that promise with ourselves that we will no longer put a face on and pretend and be fake that we can lead first out of our own brokenness and vulnerability and again I'm going to close with 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 the story of Joseph and in the story of Joseph, you can find that in Genesis probably, I, th I think it starts in 37 and goes through 50. But as you know, Joseph, you know, and, and his brothers and his brothers were, were jealous and they ended up selling him and putting him in the, the pit and he, he ends up in, you know, this whole story of Joseph, right? But what, the interesting part of this, and I'm going to read this, it was a paragraph in, in, in the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and it says this, Joseph embraced his past by grieving and forgiving. He allowed God to work in him through it, and he saw God's hand moving in and through all the events of his past, even the tragic ones, to provide a means for him to be a gift to the world. And his willingness to go back enabled him to go forward and become a blessing to the nations. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying Joseph had a choice. He could have fell right back into those systems, right? One of the best classes, except for Dan Ulrich's class, I'll, I'll just say that. <laughs> one of my, one of the most, the classes I got the most out of in, in graduate school was family systems. And in family systems, it's something that we all should work at. 
But in family systems, they, they help you make a family tree, but it's not like a regular family tree. You, you, they call it a genogram that you're making. And you start to put connections between family members. So, so you can say, this guy was an alcoholic, this guy had an affair, this guy was controlling, this woman was this, this, you know, and you find the patterns in your family and you see where they're, they're going. Because part of family system says that no matter what family we are in, no matter where we come from, we all have a part to play, right? And that part, whether it's good or bad, keeps a balance. Homeostasis, they call it, right? So then when one person tries to change, so in my family, we had this, this system. I decided I'm going to Florida to college, so I removed myself from that system, and then it's not balanced anymore. So whatever family, they, what your family does is they try to build that gap, and most of the time, most of the time, they pull you back into that system because sometimes we don't have the power, we don't want to do it, and, and, and family systems are very powerful. I remember, and I'm going off on a tangent, but I remember the first time I went to um, L.A. and to Tijuana on the mission trip, and, and this, this really showed me how powerful family systems can be. I was talking to, I, uh, boy, I was in my early 20s, and I think this, this African-American kid was in his early 20s, but we were talking about bettering ourselves and coming out and trying to be better than we, where we are. And first, he, we went to the ocean, and he lived in L.A. his entire life, Never went to the ocean, even though it was like two miles away. I can't remember. But he was stayed in his little system. But then he says he had a chance to go to college. And he had a chance to better himself. But his family and his friends made fun of him. And, and made him sound like, oh man, you're going to try to better yourself. You're better than us. All of these things. And he was trying to change that system. But his family kept him in it. That's how powerful we are. That's how powerful it is. That's why when we say what you do matters, it really, really does. If we want to end the systems, if we want to change, it's going to take bravery to step out and say no more. It's going to take bravery to say, all right, you know, this is how we do things all the time, but now I am a child of God, and God and Christ are showing me a different way so we can be better. It doesn't mean that you're not John anymore. It doesn't mean that you don't have this personality anymore. It just means that you realize that you are bigger than that, and that God has something in store for you and can use that and be a blessing. As Joseph, as it was saying to Joseph, he used his broken past to become a blessing to many in the future. But it's mentality. You know, I joke all the time about me going to the gym, right? And you see me here every Sunday, I never change, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's true, but, but, but I come up with excuses and I, I don't want to do the hard work and I'm sitting home going, I need to go, I need to go, but I don't want to get up, I got to change, I got to go put shoes on. I, you know, you don't want to do all of that. And then a week's gone and then you're like, well, I guess I got to go up a size of my pants. But, <laughs> and, and I, 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 I'm making light, but we do that in our spiritual lives all the time. If it's hard and it costs us something, it's really tough but we know it's worth it. And God says, if you want to have that life, if you want to live that life and have it more abundantly, you have to start at the beginning and take ownership of who you are to figure out those things that need some help, figure out those things that I'm holding on to that belong to the earthly family and let them go and let God transform me about being transformed. It's hard and, and, and it sounds easy, and, and I've been doing this for almost, a, what, a quarter of a century now. And it's tough. And it's, I can't, there's no other word for me to say other than it's tough. Our spiritual lives, this world, it's hard, but it's worth it. And when we can let God be made known through us, imagine how we can change this world. But again, it starts with us looking back to go forward. Another thing, genetics. I sweat a lot. That's my parents' fault. <laughs> so let us pray. Lord, I thank you. And Lord, we thank you that you have brought us into your family, that you tell us that we can be the best version of ourselves. But Lord, it takes work. So ever, wherever we may be this morning, whether we have done the hard work and taken stock of ourselves or we are just at the beginning, walk with us 
Help us to discover those things that we can work on. Help us to live into who you are calling us to be so that we can be like the players in the Bible and go out and be a blessing to the nations. But Lord, help it to start with us. And most of all, help us to know that we are loved and worth you. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. If you'll please stand as they come to close us. Please rise in body or spirit as we sing our last song. In the bowl there is a flower. There is a flower in the seed and apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word in melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery. Unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. In the end is our beginning. In our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death the resurrection, at the last a victory, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. As we prepare to leave this place, I want to leave you with this verse. And it's one of a powerful verses in my life. And this is in the 20th verse of the 50th chapter of Genesis. And this is when Joseph confronts his brothers. And his brothers are worried that Joseph is going to take revenge on them. And Joseph says this, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I don't know why things happen. I don't know why people do evil things. I don't know why life hurts sometimes. And when people try to hurt people. But we hear right here saying that it doesn't matter why. God will use it for good somehow. God will use it for good. So as we leave this place, may we know that God is with us, and no matter where we come from, God is walking with us from here on out. And one final time today, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.